I will talk today about molecular means towards carbon dioxide reduction. And because this might be a bit too chemist for the variety of uh, audience that we have, I'm gonna sometime explain the, like the basic of each technique or try to go slow in some kind of explanations during the whole talk. And exactly like right now, I'm gonna tell you about the, what is cyclic voltammetry, right? Because cyclic voltammetry is an electrochemical technique that we use to analyze the electrochemical properties of our molecular complexes in solution. And also what we normally use when we start to understand some electrocatalytic process in our organic solutions or molecular complexes. So for you to have an idea, um, this is how the average electrochemical cell looks like. We have a counter electrode, which is made of platinum wire normally. The working electrode throughout the talk will be always a, something based on carbon, normally classic carbon. And the reference electrode that in our case is the saturated calomel electrode. What we have in this solution is, um, it's not working, wait. Hmm. Hmm. I see. Sorry for that. No way. Okay. So what we have normally is our complex in a 0 0.5 to 2 millimolar concentration, an organic solvent, which normally is going to be acetonitrile or a methylformamide. And of course, the supporting electrolyte, which is going to allow us to have conductivity in an organic solvent, which is composed by tetrabutyl ammonium, an organic substrate, cationic, and the inorganic um, anion, which is uh, hexafluorophosphate, PF6. For this specific example, um, I'm going to show you how the CV looks like for this nickel 2 that, I, that we made in our lab in one millimolar concentration, acetonitrile, tetrabutyl ammonium, PF6, 0 0.1 molar. So we have a nickel two species and we're going to transform it to nickel one, okay? So how the CV looks like. So when you start reducing, you go from a, from a certain potential to a more negative potential, and then you increase again the potential, we'll put it again. Uh, so you go, you decrease the potential, then you increase, and this is the, the signal that you are gonna get, right? So um, how you can see this. So if, uh, if you have your electrode, and you have your nickel compounds in solution. When you establish, you start to put this reduction, if uh, start to decrease the potential, you will generate a diffusion layer. And within that diffusion layer, some species will be transformed into redu the reduced species by heterogeneous transfer of the electron from the electrode to our complex, which is this guy in the solution, in which the remaining bulk solution is going to be untouched or unaffected. Uh, the shape of this um, of this uh, cyclic voltammogram is uh, it's due to two effects. One is the electron kinetic transfer. So if it's a fast transfer, it's going to be very steep. And the mass transfer that gives you this kind of uh, less symmetrical um, curve that we observe here. If we want to see this from an energy point of view, if you are in the reduction uh, part, the cathodic part. So what's going to happen is that you're going to increase the level of energy in the electrode till a certain level in which the electron is going to be transferred to the complex. And on the other hand, if you're in the oxidation part, what we will do is we will reduce the energy levels of the electrode and then the electron will be transferred from the complex into the electrode, right? So, and, and this is what we are going to be using most of our talk to understand the electrochemical response of a compound or to understand the electrocatalytic um, reaction for CO2, okay, reduction. So our motivation, why we would um, start doing this type of uh, electrochemical reduction. So we started of course by the Paris Agreement and now with the COP26 in Glasgow, recognizing that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees requires rapid, deep and sustained reduction of uh, global greenhouse gas emission. This means we need to change how we consume energy and how we do chemistry to reduce that CO2 emission to the atmosphere. On the other hand, um, the chemical industry consumes up to 25% of uh, global energy consumption, and it would be beneficial if we can reduce that by 10% by 2030. And how electrochemistry helps here? Well, if we are able to, um, to obtain electrochemical reactions or electrocatalytic reactions to transform certain compounds, 
into the most efficient level, this means that we can put the minimum energy necessary to add these electrons that after all are those involved in a chemical transformation. It could be cleavaging a certain bond or forming certain bonds. And on top of that, the advanced performance in renewable energy allow us to obtain renewable electricity at a lower price than the cheap, like the newest um, mine code that could exist now on earth. However, we have this always the same problem, no? the intermittent penetration, which forces us to establish some kind of energy storage or energy storage solution. And this is through the energy density of chemical bonds. Okay. Uh, of course, we know this already. No, we all, everybody has a phone. So we have the lithium batteries. Now there is a lot in Europe going on with the green hydrogen. But we thought maybe a better approach would be the electrochemical carbon dioxide reduction reaction. And this is because if you see the transformation of carbon dioxide as a CO2 clock, you could see that by adding uh, electrons and protons, you can transform CO2 into um, oxalate, carbon monoxide, formic acid, formaldehyde, methanol, and methane. And why is this beneficial? Well, if we are able to transform carbon dioxide into fuel, that already allow us to keep using the same motorization system that we have in our planet, which change it entirely would be kind of um, difficult or even impossible currently. And also in the same way, it provides us as a source of chemical feedstock without needing the, the common uh, source of uh, petrochemical industry. So how can we envision this? We could see that our electrochemical device could be capturing the CO2 or obtaining this CO2 from the industry and combining it with renewable electricity to transform our chemical feedstock or fuels that could be used in a long-term energy storage. And these circles can go in circles, so we could consider that we have zero emissions of CO2 or even negative because part of that CO2 is going to be transformed to chemical feedstock that will go to pharmaceutical, uh, fertilizers, or polymers or building block. And what can we say about a molecular level of electrochemical carbon dioxide uh, reduction reaction? So in this very uh, simple scheme, we have the cathode surface. The cathode is where the reduction takes place. So the electrode is going to donate electrons to the complex or the molecular electrocatalyst. So our molecular electrocatalyst will take those electrons will generate a new species, and that species can interact with carbon dioxide in a certain fashion, which in the presence of certain additive, but it could be protons or other source of, um, of chemicals, will eventually give our one carbon-based product. Uh, why is good or why molecular electrocatalyst? Well, on one hand, we know the structure activity relationship. If we know how a molecule looks like, how it, how it interacts with the CO2, and we do a study of how different give us certain results, we can reach to this understanding of structure activity relationship. On the other hand, because we are molecular chemists or synthetic chemists, we could see how tuning or changing those molecules could help us not only to get maybe a higher selectivity, but also control the energy input that we need to put to transform certain chemical transformation. And this help, this cannot be applied not only for CO2 reduction, but to any kind of chemical reaction, right? And this goes in hand with what I said before of reducing the global energy consumption in the chemical industry. Uh, as examples of molecular electrocatalyst, I could show you like the three general ones that have been used in our laboratories in Paris. In the last years, the iron porphyrins, which are one of the most selective uh, electrocatalysts and uh, effective catalysts, also the call of cobalt thalocyanine and uh, metal and the quadrupyridine based metal complex. And although these compounds say, okay, these are very effective compounds, they are excellent electrocatalysts, we need to look a little bit deeper and see that the synthesis of these compounds requires a lot of manpower, a lot of time. And not always when you develop a molecular electrocatalyst, you will get the desired results, as I will show you in the next slide. For example, with this iron porphyrin, during the synthesis, 
four different species will be generated and will need to be separated, okay, to really understand how each one affects and inter and promote the, the electroreduction of CO2. But before you get there, you need to synthesize it. And that takes several steps in which only the first one already gives you 12% yield, which means that 88% goes to the trash as chemical waste. And then you have all these steps which are kind of tedious. So we need to take into consideration that when we talk about the molecular electrocatalyst, we need to think that before that metal complex become an electrocatalyst, need to have a study and there's a lot of effort going there. And these are only three examples in our laboratory because the truth is that the, like if you check the literature every week, there are many, many species coming out like molecular electrocatalyst just for electro for electro reduction of CO2. These two schemes are taken from this uh, review from Leitner from 2021 in Angevante And this is the literature reports only for CO production from CO2. This is from for the production of formic acid. And here shows you the different metal, the transition metals being used as molecular electrocatalysts. Then you also have the heterogeneous catalyst. So there is a huge um, a vast number of uh, reports related to this. And that's why we came with our first idea, no? like uh, how we could help to avoid all this massive synthesis to try to reach to an understanding of a molecular electrocatalyst. And maybe a good approach would be, okay, let's synthesize one single molecule that we can remotely tune, and maybe we can get different reactivity using just one molecule instead of developing several of them. And this is not an idea that comes from us. This is something that's been reported in the past for homogeneous catalysis and in, um, in solution reactions. For example, uh, the group of Tile uh, reported in Organometallics in 2016 that this molecule, when you add a Lewis acid, this one interacts with the back part of the ligand, reducing the, um, the, um, the strength of the bond of the platinum nitrogen bond which eventually favor the reductive coupling of these aryl groups. Also in organometallics, Agapi reported how different Lewis acid could have an effect in the electron properties of the nickel because it's slightly bound to this double bond and through the pyridine ring, it sees an effect. Most importantly, this uh, paper by Bassan show that this compound that exists in equilibrium when you put a Lewis acid, it shifts to this species and this become suddenly a, a catalyst for the polymerization of all of them. So with this approach of like how the addition of a Lewis acid can remotely, inter like how interact with a, with a organic platform that remotely activates the metal center and inspired by the iron hydrogenase, we developed this manganese compound to try to study CO2 electrochemical reduction in the presence of Lewis acid by using this uh, oxygen group in our ligand, which is known to cooperate with the metal center. So, and also because it could be related through, um, could give some level of interaction or uh, variation in the electron properties of the manganese center. So we take our compound and this compound is very easily made in three steps. So. This ligand takes one step. So actually it's two steps. This is one step to synthesize the ligand and then another step to synthesize the compound. So in two steps, you have this manganese complex already synthesized. And as an inorganic molecular chemist, when you have a compound, you need to characterize it. So we obtain the X-ray diffraction studies from the molecule, from the crystals that are obtained pure. And that give us the results in the solid state and then in the in solution state. So we get the high resolution mass spec to know which is the mass in solution of the cationic form. Also, if you have carbonyl groups, it's always good to do some infrared studies to really observe the, the bands for the IR for the carbonyl groups that are attached to our metal center. And because our compound is diamagnetic and it has protons in the ligand frame, in the ligand framework, so the proton NMR allow us also to characterize it, to have an understanding of how this compound, how this compound is in solution and in the solid state. So finally, we also studied the, we performed the cyclic voltammogram of the complex. Now it's a bit 
more like it's not as simple as the one that I showed in the beginning, but I just want you to look at this part, which is the one that occurs if we look, go in this direction, is the one that occurs in the cathode, like in the reduction side. And this curve corresponds to one electron reduction of the manganese complex going from manganese one to manganese zero. And this is performed under argon, okay? So under inert atmosphere in acetonitra, okay? So how we studied the interaction of the, the different alkali salts. So what we will do, we'll put a first, in, a set, in a, this case, I think it was a BMF solution. We take this salt, okay? This salt is potassium barf, and barf is this borate anion, which is very bulky, non-coordinating. And, and we use this type of anion because we don't want any kind of interaction to occur with our complex. So we want that our complex would only interact with the potassium salt. If I show you this, it doesn't tell you much, right? Because we see that bands become broad, everything becomes messy. So you really need to take a look in a different way. And what we will observe or pay attention is at the different um, chemical shifts. So this is like, if this band appears now at this level, how this band is going to slightly move and how the chemical shift is going to be changing. And we observe that this one, for example, that experienced the biggest uh, uh, change in the chemical shift correspond to this proton, which is the closest to the potassium. So that kind of makes sense because um, our oxygen is going to start uh, decreasing its electron density and that's going to have an effect on the protons in the ring, as we can see. In the same way, these protons that are far away from the group that is interacting with potassium will, will remain the same, not without seeing any drastic change in their chemical shift. So this already tell us that in solution, when we put a Lewis acid, in this case, an alkali metal salt, it give an impact in the ligand frame. But we want to see what is occurring to the metal center. Also, if the carbon, if the carbonyls will be affected. By IR, we see that the carbonyls remain intact. So we know that the potassium is only interacting with the oxygen and not with the carbonyl group. To see if it has an effect on the metal center, we need to go to do the cyclic voltammograms with the different additions of the, of the metal salts. And what we observe is that when we increase the content in lithium, sodium, potassium, or magnesium, we observe that the potential is shifted to uh, less negative or more positive values of, the, of, the, of potential, which makes sense. Because in fact, what we are doing is that we are reducing the electron density here by this interaction. And therefore the manganese also will be reducing the electron density because it's correlated through the nitrogen bond and through the oxygen, through the oxygen atom. So now it's easier to introduce that electron. We use less energy to introduce that electron to transform manganese one to manganese zero, okay? And this has a Nernstian response as we could observe by applying the, the, the Nernst law. In this, uh, into this uh, experiment. When we perform the, the CD under carbon dioxide, without the addition of any salt, we observe now an increase in the current. Having the same amount of manganese and observing an increase in the current, no, the, the increase in the consumption of electron, this usually is related to an electrocatalytic effect. This is that the CO2 now that these electrons that are increasing the consumption are going somewhere. And this somewhere is usually the carbon dioxide. When we did the studies in the presence of uh, alkali salts, we observed that depending on the salt, we see a higher uh, catalytic current or it decreases the catalytic current. And when the salt that is added is strongly binding, like the magnesium too, then the catalysis is even inhibited. We perform, so this is, when we perform the cyclic voltammogram. But when we want to analyze the products that are being formed during this, the, during this reaction, we need to go and perform the electrolysis. So this is what we call a control, uh, a CPE control potential electrolysis, where we hold the potential and we perform an electrolysis at a certain potential. When we perform an electrolysis at a certain potential, which is usually like a SWAT minus 1.9, minus 
uh, minus uh, 2.0, we observe that we generate CO. However, this amount of CO is not that uh, outstanding. And this is because the, this, the electrode is being passivated by the generation of carbonate, which is a subproduct from the reduction of, uh, of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is being reduced to CO. And on the other hand, because we work in anhydrous condition and in the presence of Lewis acids, what we generate as a subproduct is carbonate, and the carbonate passivate the electrode. And this was also observed by, um, by X-ray diffraction studies, no, by yeah, X-ray diffraction studies of XPS by measuring the surface of the electrode after the experiment. So what we conclude about this uh, work is that we have synthesized a new compound that uh, has this uh, pyridon ring that actually has this pending oxygen atom that can interact with uh, different alkali metals. And this has an effect on the electron properties of the transition metal. And therefore we can really like tune this um, potential to be applied to reduce the complex. And CV studies under CO2 exhibit electrocatalytic activity in, with this manganese complex. However, the electrocatalytic activity is not outstanding due to this effect of passivation of the electrode. So what else can we do? Because this was just one side of the project, no? like how we could, using one single metal, change the electronic properties by adding different additives. So let's go to, again to the molecular electrocatalyst. The example that I showed now and the example that we have in the lab, they are all monometallic metal. And as a monometallic metal, it has only the possibility of binding with the CO2 in two different ways, okay? Or through the carbon atom of the carbon dioxide or through the double bond of the carbon dioxide, being this a very rare case. So if we want, we could, we could envision that if you have only two modes of coordination, your, rea your reaction pathway is going to be limited because you start only from two pathways. If you could increase this, to more different type of, mo of coordination modes, maybe you could increase the reactivity and maybe even add the, like more carbons into the product. So facilitating that two, ca two carbon dioxide molecules could combine to give a C2 product. And that's something that not only comes from us, it's something that's been occurring in the literature from the 80s, and it's the development of molecular electrocatalysts containing more than, more than one metal. In this case, I only show bimetallic electrocatalysts for CO2 reduction. From all of them, I can tell you that uh, this copper one is the only example in the literature of a molecular uh, bimetallic uh, complex that can promote the formation of oxalate. This is the generation of a C2 product from CO2. Uh, this is an outstanding report in which uh, CO2 can be transformed into methane, or in this case, how by changing the angle of the approach of the two porphyrins, you can, by decreasing it to the minimum, you can increase the, the catalytic activity of the iron center by a cooperative means. As we can see here, that a, mono, um, a monometallic molecular compound acts in cooperation with another monometallic molecular compound to activate and transform carbon dioxide under electrocatalytic conditions. So with this in mind, we came to the following approach. We wanted to use a ligand platform that doesn't allow metal-metal interaction, just to facilitate our studies. Because if you start to generate in metal-metal bonds, it could complicate a lot of our story and the studies. Then we wanted to use terpiridine fragments because terpiridine fragments are known to facilitate the um, the reaction of the, redu the reduction reaction of CO2 by locating electrons in their frame and therefore reducing the overpotential of the reaction. In the same way, we have this fragment and we, our lab had experience with these quaterpiridine cobalt complexes. So combining these three approaches, we decided to create this new system, which is the same pyrazole fragment here, but now bearing these terpiridine groups. And we synthesize this cobalt system to have something to compare with the monometallic counterpart. So as I said before, we have a bimetallic system and what we do is to characterize it. So we get the, first we get the X-ray structures in the solid state from the, from the pure crystals that are obtained. 
we get the mass spec of how the compound looks like in solution. And then because this compound is paramagnetic, we studied the, the magnetic moment in solution. And we observed that the magnetic moment in solution is smaller, slightly smaller than those observed for high spin uh, cobalt two uh, octahedral complexes. So we also performed uh, with the collaboration with some colleagues in Seville, we calculate through computational studies. And we observe that there is some level of antiferromagnetic coupling that could be in involved in the reduction of that uh, magnetic moment in solution. So with this in mind, we started to move to the cyclic voltammetry study. And uh, we start in acetonitrile, right? So if we do our first CV, we observe uh, this reversible, much nicer uh, redox uh, event. But when we start moving forward or move to more negative potential, we start to see other type of uh, redox event that are not any more uh, diffusive uh, related processes. And when I mean diffusive related, it, related is because what it seems is like at this uh, potential or compound and the reduction condition is getting absorbed on the surface. A confirmation for this is when we do fast scan cyclic voltammetry, and we observe that this signal or this peak disappears because when we perform the CV at such high, uh, such high scans, there is no time for the molecule to get absorbed at the surface of the electrode. But we stop now that we saw the three different waves. We will stop in the first one to understand what is happening in this first redox event. So for that, we're going to do the UVV spectral electrochemistry, which means that we're going to take um, a new cell, new electrochemical cell, which now the working electrode is a piece of carbon paper with some holes that allows the light to go through. And we will analyze the UVVs spectra of this compound while performing an electrolysis. In this way, we will see the evolution of the compound from, from our cobalt to cobalt to complex to the reduced form. For that, we do first a, a new CV under these new uh, electrochemical cells in which we have different references. So of course, now the values are gonna shift. And once we see where we can stop and when, when we can stop in the reduction and when we can stop in the oxidation, we perform the, electro, the electrolysis at minus 1.4 volts. So we see that the green line, that is our initial spectra, is going to be shifting to the new blue line that is the new spectra for the new complex that is being formed under electroreduction condition. Interestingly, when we go from here to minus 0.2 volts, so we reoxidize the species, we, start, we generate again the initial spectra, okay? Showing that this is in fact a reversible process. But how can we get information out of this, like beyond the information of this spectra and the new bands that we observe? Is by performing now a chemical reduction and comparing the UEVs from the chemical reduction with the UEVs from electrochemical reduction. For that, we're gonna use uh, cobaltosine, because cobaltosine uh, is known to donate one electron at, for those compounds that are uh, more positive than minus 0 0.9, which means that this species should be reduced in principle by the presence of cobaltosine. And in fact, when we put cobaltosine, when we put one equivalent, which is the red line, we don't see much of a difference. But when we put two equivalents, then we observe that uh, we generate the the similar spectra that is generated from uh, spectral electrochemistry, giving us the answer that this process is in fact involving a two electron process, okay? But we don't know where these electrons are falling because in the case of the manganese, we knew that the electrons were going to the manganese. So we were going from manganese one to manganese zero. But in this case, we wanted to know where these electrons are going. If they're going to the cobalt or if they are going to the ligand. Because I said before, the tripedian fragments are known to delocalize the electron density when these are put under electrochemical reduction conditions. And in fact, uh, with the help of our colleagues, uh, we observe that the electron density is actually located at the tripedian for the first electron and also for the second electron. 
and that these two electrons comes to the system at the same energy potential, which match with this first uh, redox curve that we observe here. So now we know that the first curve corresponds for a two electron reduction in which the electrons are going to the terpidine fragment. So it's going to our ligand, okay? And the cobalt remain cobalt two. But because uh, this is a non-diffusive process, it difficult our studies to know what's going on in the other redox event. For that, we perform the same CV, but instead of doing it in acetonitrile, we do it in dimethylformamide, DMF. And now we observe a more common uh, diffusive process, okay? Uh, to understand what's going on here and how we could modify it or if the solvent is being, how the solvent affects the, the redox properties of this compound and the, in the electrode. What we did now is to add uh, DMF in the acetonitrile solution. And we observe that this model is changing from the initial spectra, okay, that is more symmetric with a non diffusive process, to a spectra here in dark red, which already resembles that that is obtained in DMF, which is this one here. Also, and to do the vice versa of this, we add acetonitrile to the DMF solution. And in this case, we although we could say that it remains almost identical, what we observe is a change in the ratio between this redox event two and the redox event three, indicating that then if this if this ratio is not being kept, most likely shows that this redox event has to do with a dynamic effect of the complex in solution during the electron transfer, such as uh, the coordination or the coordination of a, of a solvent molecule. So to learn more and to know what this redox event could be related to, we now move to the synthesis of a bimetallic zinc complex. And the reason to develop this bimetallic zinc complex is because zinc is a non-redox active uh, metal center. And therefore, if we perform a CV, if we any kind of wave related in the CV will be related to the ligand participating, but never by the zinc, because this cannot uh, intervene under this condition. Of course, before that, we characterize our compounds by proton NMR and carbon NMR which uh, show us uh, that allow us to characterize that the ligand is really attached to the metal center. We also perform like elemental analysis and high resolution mass spec of the compound in solution. And finally, here what I put being one, the cobalt complex and two, the zinc complex. Okay, so the dashed line correspond to the zinc complex. We compare in DMF and in acetonitrile. We observe that this, this band does not exist. But on the other hand, now we observe a band here for the zinc that falls in between redox three and redox two in both cases, knowing that in red cannot be really taken in consideration since we know that this is already a non-diffusive process and the compound is being supported in the electrode surface. So what this might tell us is that the second redox event is also involving more clearly the participation of the liga. And again, when we do two uh, theoretical studies, we observe that if we start from the reduced species already in which we have the electron delocalized in the ligand and we put two electron more, these are going again to the ligand framework. So what we can state is that under inert atmosphere, under inert atmosphere, the electrons are going to the ligand framework and the cobalt remain as cobalt. So what happened to like to the compound under or how is the response under CO2, the electrochemical response? Well, when we perform the CV under CO2 in acetonitrile or in DMF, we see an increase in the catalytic current, in the current, which means that it has some kind of electrocatalytic activity. And although the shape is very different in both cases, mostly related to the fact that we have here a strong inhibition process due to the participation of the substrate in the surface and non-diffusive processes. What we see in both cases is this little curve here, this little band when we go back 
and we oxidize a species, we see the same signal in both. And this has been assigned to a carbon monoxide cobalt complex. We know this because we have performed the same experiment, not just under CO2, but under carbon monoxide. And under carbon monoxide, we observe the increase of this band, of this, um, of this curve with time or reduction. For instance, if we stop in the first reduction process, so the first redox event, and we do it in CO, we observe that this is no more than the coordination of the CO to the, to the cobalt center. For instance, if we go very slowly, we perform this CV in a very slow fashion, we observe that after it's reduced, because this is taking too long, there is enough time for the CO to displace maybe one of the ligands, such as the solvent that could be coordinated to the metal center to generate some type of cobalt uh, carbon monoxide containing species. However, in red color, it performs at higher, at higher speed. If we do this reduction and oxidation really fast, there is no time for the carbon monoxide to displace the solvent, for example, from the metal center. And then the peak of the species containing the carbon monoxide is much smaller than the species containing the solvent. But of course, this is an indirect method of knowing that we have here a carbon monoxide species. To have a direct methodology and see if we are really generating CO in situ, we need to go to other type of techniques. And here we use infrared spectroelectrochemistry, which is nothing else than using the common infrared cell, but that inside we have a little electrochemical cell. And when we perform a control potential electrolysis under, this, um, under these conditions, we observe the generation of a new band of the carbon that is, um, is due to the presence of a cobalt carbonyl uh, bond. If, and I need to state that this is performed under CO2. Therefore, that CO that is being generated comes from the reduction of CO2. However, when we perform again the control potential electrolysis under anhydrous conditions, again, we see the passivation and the low production of CO, of CO from CO2. Therefore, we need to change our approach. And thus, we started to study the electrochemical response under CO2 in the presence of bronze acids. This is protons. And why protons? Because uh, protons are known not just to stabilize the intermediate that could be generated due to the electroreduction of the metal in the presence of CO2, but also because it facilitates the cleavage of the oxygen carbon bond by the generation of water. So now I will show you different examples of how this, the CV looks in the presence of different, um, different proton source. For example, <clears throat> the, red, the red CD is our compound in DMF, CO2, in the presence of water. The blue one is in the presence of phenol, and the green one is in the presence of trifluoroethanol. So from red to green, we are increasing the acidity of our proton source in the organic solvent. Now, uh, R1 is the same R1 that I show in the presence of uh, carbon monoxide, is the, is the two electron reduction of our bimetallic cobalt compound. But then the redox two is already some electrocatalytic process. And redox C is a different electrocatalytic process. The difference between R3 and R2 is the potential at which uh, the reaction occurs. So at R3, we have a much negative potential. Therefore, we are forcing the reaction conditions. And because we force the reaction conditions, the difference between R3 and R2 in both cases is that in R3, we generate more hydrogen than CO2. And this is because when you have protons and you have CO2 and you have electrons, you can have a selective process, but also you can have competitive process for proton reduction and CO2 reduction. So because we are interested in the CO2 part, I will tell you that we studied R3 and R2, but because R3 is not interesting because it's very negative potential and also not selective, we'll move to the R2 and just leave the non dash uh, CVs. Something that is not, that that could uh, that you should know is that when we observe R1, 
it resembles the reversibility, okay? In all cases, we see some kind of reversibility in our CV. And this is a, is a good indicative because that means that our compound is performing the electrocatalysis, but by the time it comes back, we have the starting material reduced, but it's always required to be oxidized, okay? So it means that the compound is alive and is able to perform the electrocatalysis and to come back to, this, to the initial of the cycle. Um, but, but as I said, to know what's happening, we need to perform control potential electrolysis because through control potential electrolysis, we can then have a bulk solution from which we can analyze the, the product. And this is what we obtain from our potentiostat when we perform control potential electrolysis, okay? For now, I just want you to pay attention to this, uh, to this graph for those that are not used to seeing this type of uh, schemes or figures. I will tell you that the dashed lines are the blank solution. So no same conditions, no metal complex. And the straight lines or the non-dashed lines are those that contains our compound. What you can see in the red color is that if you have the cobalt complex, you have a much uh, consumption of electrons which makes sense because you have a cobalt complex that is doing this electrocatalysis and is pushing those electrons inside the CO2 molecule. And the black lines are telling you how much uh, charge or electrons are being used throughout the process. If we look at the table, we can see that when we increase the acidity from water to phenol to trifluoroethanol, we observe an increase in the turnover numbers of CO. Turnover numbers is the numbers of CO that are generated per, per catalytic cycle. So we could say that here we have 17 catalytic cycles. So one cobalt complex is able to, to generate, per, per cobalt complex, we can generate um, 17 CO molecules. On the other hand, not only by increasing the acidity, we increase the formation of uh, CO, but also we decrease the formation of hydrogen. Therefore, we increase the selectivity. So these are really, really good results. In fact, the potential at which occur also is rather low. It's, uh, it's among the catalysts with the lowest uh, over potential. However, there's always some negative result. And in this case is the Faradic efficiency because the Faradic efficiency of our compound, the Faradic efficiency is, uh, it will tell us how many electrons are being used in the reaction. This is, if we would have a 100% Faradic efficiency, it would mean that all the electrons that are being release by the potential that will go to the transformation of CO2. However, in our case, we never passed the 50%, which means that our process is not really that efficient, okay? And because it's not really that efficient, then we wanted to also study the photochemical response under CO2 in the presence of bronzed acid. And that's why we study the photocatalytic activity of this complex in the presence of um, ruthenium 3 b pyridine as the photosensitizer, uh, BIH as the sacrificial donor, because we need to take the electrons from somewhere, and still use the same TFE as the source of proton. In this case, what we observe is that when the time advance, we generate, we increase the turnover numbers of CO that in this case is much higher than when we perform the electrochemical, uh, the electrocatalytic reaction. And still with lower numbers, of, um, of hydrogen. So what we can con conclude from here is that our new pyrazole system, um, first, we see that the, the, it falls in two electron processes, the reduction reaction under argon, and that the, the participation of the ligand framework helps to reduce the overpotential. Also that uh, is selective, 94% selectivity towards uh, the electrocatalytic reduction of CO2 to CO. But also by photocatalytic activity, we get 133 turnover numbers, which is rather good result. And uh, what else are we going, what, what else we've been doing in our lab? Because these are the two close projects we've been doing, but we also have developed others, uh, other ligand synthesis, uh, other ligands based on the same approach than the the one reported with the manganese. And we have developed several complexes that they have been studied. Some of them have been studied, have been, others are still in the queue to be studied. 
For example, this nickel complex, that was the one that we used for in the beginning to explain what was a cyclic voltammogram. So this has been fully characterized and it's ready to be published. And we know that this is a, a one electron process because we use the Randless Fick equation and we, we measure the diffusion coefficient. And we also studied the, the UEV spectral electrochemistry to see this reversibility of nickel one nickel minus one, but more interestingly, because our group, because this ligand has this uh, oxygen group that we show that has some interaction with Lewis acid in the same way, it has interaction with protons. And when we put this compound in the presence of water and we crystallize it, we see that it can have this uh, inner, inner, bind, inner bondings and also intermolecular bondings between the oxygen of the pyridone ring and the water that is bind to the metal center. As water can be, we could use other kind of solvents or organic molecules or inorganic molecules. And in the case this is water, we can see that it has some, our preliminary studies show some electrocatalytic reduction of uh, water, but also the binding of water reduce the potential towards oxidation, which could be used for and not only electrochemical reduction, but also electrochemical oxidation. And moreover, uh, we can use this electrochemical oxidation to perform the, to promote the oxidation of formic acid to CO2, which some could say that is kind of ridiculous, no? Because why are you putting electrons to generate formic acid and then could remove those electrons from formic acid to generate CO2? And that's not nothing else, but, uh, but actually a battery based on CO2. So it would be nice that only by using electrons, we could, con we could close this, this cycle to form CO2 and, and formic acid. But um, importantly, one of the good things of the MOVGA is that through Giuliano Giambastiani, so we were able to contact with Andrea Rosin and we have sent him some of this compound that they're going to study for ammonia borane dehydrogenation catalysis. So that's a good part of the MOVGA, this little network that we have. And of course, nothing of this could be done alone. So uh, besides this uh, contribution, we'll go easily, we'll go directly to, the, to acknowledge who's behind this work. So this is the group I was working with, or I was involved with in uh, Université Paris Cité. And this is Anandi, which worked in the first project, the manganese uh, project. This is Antoine Bon, who has been working in the project of uh, the bicobalt system. And both have been working in the development of the nickel project. Here is Juanjo, who has developed the, who has performed all the theoretical studies. And these are different professors and researchers that have participated somehow or in the theoretical aspects of electrochemistry or magnetic measurements or technical aspects. And to finalize, as, uh, as uh, Reiner said before, now I started a new period from March, thanks to the fellowship Ramon y Cajal in Sevilla. And you are welcome to visit the website and to interact if you have want to know more about the possibility of collaborating and engaging through the University of Seville. And with that, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Orestes, for this uh, very detailed talk. Um, yeah, if you have questions, you can either type them in the chat or in the question and answer tool, and I will um, read them out, or you can also raise your hand um, if you would like to ask anything. Um, you, you mentioned the, the carbonation of the electrode in the first example as the main uh, final problem. Is there something around, around this? The what? The, that the carbon accumulates on the on the electrode or the carbonate yeah yeah so that was uh in that specific part was the main problem that mm -hmm. uh, because you generate carbonate the electron surface get covered on carbonate and then your molecules that are in solution cannot reach to the electrode that is actually donating those electrons mm -hmm. so you actually block the surface and it stops mm -hmm. being catalytic reactive Okay, it's cells. something that was reported in the past. So that's why people tend to work in a aqueous media mm -hmm. rather than in organic solvents in the presence of carbonate, because obviously carbonate is uh, unsoluble in organic solvents. So mm -hmm. and that means, I mean, your your catalyst can be used um, 
in this way or not? So, so the goal is that, um, so first how we, how we start these uh, studies is that first we, first we analyze the catalytic response of the catalyst in organic media. If the catalyst is good, and we see that this, that is not a, like a catalyst decomposition or degradation for, for the cause of that passivation or that, uh, that is stable at long-term catalysis, then the next, the next step is to support it in an electrode by covalent binding or direct binding or make a paste that you can support over the electrode and then you can use it in water. And that's mm -hmm. the real application. So from fundamental analysis to direct application is really a small step, but you need mm -hmm. to find the right catalyst to be able to perform such step. So the examples that I have shown in the, the three examples that are the three most studies in our department, those can be easily supported in, in solid state and using water and do lab electrolyzer scale. And actually my collaborator, Professor Mark Robert has already started a little startup based on CO2 reduction because that gap was possible, that, that jump to support in electrode and perform electrolysis in water, which is the final goal, which okay. is sustainable. Mm -hmm. And how, how much of the catalyst is then needed? I mean, you showed that uh, at the end uh, that you have, that is it correct? If, did I understand you correct that the catalyst is then not too stable and that, it, that you only have a uh, few turnovers or? So in the case that I show, they are not like, a, also the, the turnover numbers differ a lot when you do the reaction in solution and when you do it in the solid state. So getting like, um, so you have this example of the quadrupedine, the mono quadrupedine that has uh, maybe 18 turnover numbers, 20 turnover numbers in the in solution. But in the moment you put it in the solid state, because also in the solid state, you 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 stop the site reactions because now the molecule is not so available. The turnover numbers just go, just spike. So even if you have a compound that doesn't have like incredible turnover numbers in solution, when you jump to the solid state and you support it, you might have a real increase. And then the amount of compound that you use is really minimal because you need to consider that you're working on a surface on a very, very, very little surface. So we're talking about micromoles. So it's really little. Mm -hmm. Plus mm -hmm. the metals that we use are abundant metals. It's not precious metals like platinum or iridium. We're talking about iron, manganese, cobalt. Although cobalt is not as abundant as iron, but these are very cheap abundant metals. Okay, uh, Subu has a question. Uh, could you give examples of some possible applications? If the effect is only at the electrode surface, I assume the extractive volume is limited, better for fluid flows with high CO2 concentrations. So I guess so the that, question is mainly, mainly about applicability. So No, no, oh, but, but hmm. that's exactly how it goes. So first you do the, first you do the solution in organic solvent and you can put it in water. But the next step, like you put it in a little piece of carbon paper, you put in a flow electrode, and then you use water that is saturated maybe with carbon, uh, with carbonate, with bicarbonate that after all act, acts as a source of CO2. And it's exactly how, what he said, like you need to do it in a, in a in an electrode flow, like flow electrolysis. Mm -hmm. And this is how you make it applicable. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, so you have this uh, to perform flow electrolysis with a gas water phase and in which your gas phase is your, if you manage to get high selectivity of CO. So let's say you are putting CO2 in one place and the electrolyte water carbonate, but then your exit is like pure CO. That would be the goal. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly the right approach. Yeah. And how far away? Uh, are we from that, that it works on an industri industrial scale? So I know that the, the, the startup of my colleague, Professor Mark, is already in the, 
startup level, like already mm -hmm. collecting money and and trying to put it in a higher scale. Mm -hmm. But to be used in an like to be really, if there is any plant right now in that, no, it's not work. Right now, it's more efficient to do the water electrolysis, get hydrogen, and use that hydrogen to hydrogenate CO2. So still, we are far from the step of direct electrolysis of CO2 to a product. Right now, they they rather use electrolysis of water, get hydrogen, and hydrogen react with the, with CO2. Mm -hmm. So we are still far from the real application, but mm -hmm. I don't I don't envision that we are that far. Plus, uh, more and more countries are real investing millions on this uh, approach. Like in Denmark, they just create a huge hub for CO two electro reduction, as well as in the United States in uh, North Carolina. So I think this is the way this electrochemical. Okay. Nice, yeah. I mean, from our work uh, on uh, climate dynamics, etc., we we see that we actively need to take out CO two from the atmosphere. So uh, it's really a critical aspect of uh, the future yeah, the, work that we ha have ahead of us. The, a big problem is the how do you say the to trap the CO two. That's that's I think that's really far. So. How you could envision this type of technology being applied is just by a, another industry that just creates loads of CO2, so that CO2 mm -hmm. can directly be transformed, mm -hmm. but not from somewhere where you can capture CO2, because the technology for capture CO2 still is not that developed, and I don't think it can really... This type of plant, you could envision it attached to another plant that generates CO2. To, to avoid the CO, CO2 being uh, yeah, so it's to recycle mm -hmm. that CO2, but not mm -hmm. as a capturing CO2 and using it. I think that's still a big gap to be to be done. Mm 